What species is this? This is a hound. Hound shark? Yes. Right. I mentioned in the previous episode that there is conflicting data about the shark population and the orca's effect upon the sharks in South Africa. South African scientists are in disagreement, but I'm willing to bet that you haven't heard the other side of the story. And indeed, unless you are looking for it, it's pretty hard to find. The orcas are to blame story is much more popular. And even if you were to look at the data from both sides of the scientific argument, let's face it, today people believe what they want to believe, regardless of which side ultimately has the most evidence supporting their side of the argument. So what if we removed the conflicting scientific reports and just used common sense? I know I just said take science out of it, but to be honest, we're going to talk about ecology a lot. That is my favorite branch of the biological sciences, which focuses on relationships between different organisms in a community, in a population. Because we live our lives so differently from wild animals, I think it's easy for the Homo sapiens species to forget that for many species, their own survival depends upon the health of the populations of other organisms around them. Let's start with a very basic concept. What happens if your food source is gone? Well, as a human being, you can probably manipulate the situation and get food to yourself one way or another. That is not what happens in the wild. That is not what happens in these ocean ecosystems. If a food source, especially a primary food source, disappears, it makes it pretty hard to continue surviving in an area. That doesn't mean there will be an immediate exodus. After all, these animals have been using the area for a very long time. To simply abandon an area all at once would be unexpected. But to eventually face the reality that you have to leave, that you have to move on, well, that's reasonable. I'm going to cover a lot today, so let me provide a table of contents. This is a list of the possible reasons for the disappearance of white sharks in South Africa. And once you become aware of the other atrocities, the crimes against other species that are taking place as collateral damage, it's hard for me not to talk a little bit about speciesism. I want to talk about compartmentalization. Chris and I kind of talked about this without labeling it, but it's the ability for people to be upset about one thing while completely overlooking the exact same atrocities happening to other species. Here's where the ecological disconnect comes in. Killing this one, no matter how you feel about that one, still means killing this one, and even this one sometimes. And when it comes to killing this one, I'm talking about indirectly by removing its food and directly by killing it with the same fishing gear meant to kill this one. Maybe people have an image that the white sharks there are out at Seal Island hunting pinnipeds year round, launching themselves out of the water like air jaws around the clock. But no, a large portion of their time is inshore, which one makes it extra incredible that there aren't more conflicts with humans and these sharks. And two, they aren't hunting pinnipeds at shore. There aren't uh, beach-based pinniped populations. So what are they doing there? They are eating fish, including, but not limited to, other species of sharks, smaller sharks. And never fear regarding there being additional evidence, them going to shore to feed on smaller sharks isn't just a theory. A 2012 study on the white sharks in South Africa confirmed what they were eating. The stomach contents of 591 white sharks confirmed their main prey was smaller sharks such as bronze whalers, smooth hounds, and soup fin sharks, the same species being targeted by the longline boats. How do you check the stomach contents of white sharks? <laughs> they have to be dead. Guess who you can thank for having access to 591 dead white sharks? The answer is not orcas. 
The fact that they go there to eat other food sources besides pinnipeds is not debated. That's accepted across the board. Therefore, we have two threats to the white shark coming from the same source. Threat number one is removing their food source. Two, the same methods being used to remove their food source is directly killing the white sharks as well. How do we know that? I would cite three sources. One, Oliver, the witness on board those boats. Oliver appears in an article that is going to be the main focus of the next episode. Two, I call living in reality because it's pretty fantastical to think that the species of shark that you care about and want to claim isn't being caught is managing to escape devices that are meant to catch sharks. Hello? Hello? Anybody home? But yes, the one that you want to say isn't getting caught, of course, isn't. Right. Uh, number three is that the fisheries department themselves conducted a test and caught three white sharks. <laughs> Apparently that test only spanned a three day period of time. Three white sharks caught in three days, two of which died. The third was released, which as I've already said, does not mean that it lived. Okay. The evidence is going to add up quickly in this episode and the information may become overwhelming. So let's just look at this for a moment. The fisheries own brief test already equates to 20, possibly 30% of what the orcas have done to the white shark population in approximately a decade of the orcas being recorded in the area. We're only scratching the surface. That's the smallest data set I have to present regarding human caused mortality to white sharks. Next, I'm going to quote Dr. Enrico Gennari, who appears in this article. He's a shark scientist in South Africa. By the fishery's own numbers, three white sharks caught over three days means that in nine weeks, the time that Oliver was on that boat, shark longliners would have caught and killed more white sharks than what Oliver reported. So Oliver's numbers are realistic. And if we extrapolate what he saw to the average demersal shark longline fleet of the last 10 or so years, it would equate to an average of 50 to 60 white sharks killed every single year. You add that to what the sharks board is killing up on the northeast coast of South Africa for those sharks that survive the fisheries on the south coast and then migrate up there just to be killed. Then you have nearly 100 whites a year being taken out of an estimated population of at most 1,000 or maybe even half of that. That's pretty crazy. Let's pretend half of that is true. That's crazy. Those are some pretty tough odds for a species to overcome, especially a species with the low reproductive rate of a white shark. I want to address the excuse makers really quick, the people that want to look anywhere except at harsh reality. Myself, as well as these rebuttal scientists, acknowledge that white sharks do show a flight response to the presence of orcas. That's not denied. However, there is also not evidence that this is simply a shift in distribution. We will dig into the evidence provided by both sides of the argument regarding the change in distribution. However, I want you to consider for a moment that there are scientists, white shark scientists, ignoring the 100 white sharks per year being killed by these other sources and focusing on these orcas. It defies everything that scientists know about the biology of the white shark to think that the white shark can survive that sort of pressure to the population. Orcas or no orcas, these white sharks are in big trouble. I contacted organizations that these scientists worked for to find out what papers they've written regarding the decline of the white sharks at the hands of the fisheries and the Kazian Sharks Board. They haven't done any. Well, that is until the government contacted them <laughs> to put together a presentation showing that it isn't the fisheries and that it is a distribution. Shortly after that, they published a paper saying that it was a distribution change. These people from now on will simply be referred to as government scientists. So for one set of scientists to quickly declare, oh no, I'm sure they're fine. They just moved to somewhere else instead of pushing for any form of conserving these sharks possible, including 
but not limited to shutting down that demersal longline fishery and going after the Natal Sharks board with full force. Well, this actually brings me to the final data set that I want to go over. It also involves one of these government scientists who, guess what, works for the Natal Sharks board. In fact, he is now the head of the Natal Sharks board. You heard me correctly. One of the scientists who co-authored a paper that favors the redistribution of the white sharks at the hands of the orcas, rather than looking at the fishing industry or the sharks board, is in fact earning his paycheck from the organization that is wiping out white sharks in South Africa. If we go back to these articles coming from the Maverick in South Africa, we see that Mr. Dickon tried to discredit Dr. Enrico Gennari by saying, no, that data is wrong, therefore your conclusions are wrong. That was a squabble over exactly how many white sharks the Natal Sharks Board kills every year, 30 or 28. <laughs> In other words, take comfort that Gennari's calculations should have indicated something closer to 90 or so white sharks killed every year, not 100. If that makes you feel better, you might be able to co-author a paper with these guys. Let me quote. The data used by Enrico is incorrect. We don't kill that many white sharks. As such, the paper's conclusions are wrong. Oh, you don't kill that many white sharks. Do you feel better about yourself, Mr. Dickon, that you kill 28, not 30? Now, in case they want to deny killing that many, I would like to point out that Dickon was co-author of a paper which reported that 1,317 white sharks were captured in the Kazian shark nets and drum lines between 1978 and 2018, and only 16% were released alive, meaning an average of 28 white sharks were killed per year. And again, I challenge the idea that something that has gone through that sort of trauma and is released actually survives. You know, this is not recovering in a hospital bed. This is an animal that is near death being released into the wild. An animal that is now susceptible to being prey for another animal in its weakened condition. An animal that is now going to have a harder time hunting. Add to all of this reports coming into me from multiple sources that the Natal Sharks Board is notorious for not telling the truth about their captures. Meaning, we are taking the very people killing the white shark and many other species for their word that it's quote unquote only 28, when in fact it is most likely more. I should probably wrap up this episode. It's a lot to think about. I didn't even get to look at Oliver's testimony yet, so we'll look at that in the next episode. But as a recap, we have the testimony of someone who was on board the shark fishery vessels saying that he saw them catch three white sharks in just the time that he was on there. We have a government publication acknowledging the high likelihood of overlap of white sharks and the targeted sharks, as well as admission of catching three in a short period of time. We have the annual catch rate based upon those numbers. We have the Natal Sharks Board's annual catches. And even if we want to believe that white sharks aren't being caught and killed in the fishing gear that is meant to catch and kill the food source of the white shark, we still have the removal of the food source, which alone is a good reason for an animal to disappear from the area. The thought I want to leave you with for this episode is that the orcas also started changing with the removal of this food source. These are fish eaters. These are shark eaters. The orcas and the white sharks both eat the same food source. If you remove that food source, it's going to cause some things to change. The possibility that I'm implying is that the orcas have had to target things that they didn't normally target because again of the removal of that same shared food source. The reports of orcas targeting the white sharks came after the published decline of those inshore shark species. So even if we were to agree that the orcas chased the white sharks away, we can still point back to this demersal shark fishery 
for causing the change in orca behavior that ultimately drove the white sharks away. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Do let me know what you think in the comments, and I hope you will join me in the next episode as I dig deeper into some of the data that the scientists don't agree upon.